Who's your favorite Ruger? <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> Welcome to the uh, joint seminar series with um, the Natural Resource Ecology Lab, the Ecosystem Science and Sustainability Department, and the North Central Climate Science Center. Um, our um, seminar series this year, is, or this fall, um, is based on a concept of how do we manage for climate change. And we've had a series of speakers um, come in talking about different aspects and uh, domestically and internationally. Um, today we have the opportunity to have um, Kristen Everett come up from Boulder, um, where she's been working on various aspects of the energy water nexus. Uh, she comes from a really uh, great background working in NOAA, um, working uh, in on the hill as a um, as a fellow there, um, and working with um, Senator Wyatt, Wyatt. Um, and also working very closely with the um, Western Water Assessment over the years. So, uh, as and now as Associate Director of the Cooperative Institute for Earth Research, Earth Sciences yeah, series um, at Boulder, she's really been working in, in close partnership with us here at CSU especially the North Central Climate Science Center, of looking at how do we really look at the various facets of climate change on our natural resources, and in particular with energy and water, where um, Kristen also was part of the author team in the last, na last National Climate Assessment, looking at this nexus, and it's really important sort of intersection, um, especially in regions like ours. So it's really a great opportunity to, to, to hear her perspective and and share her thoughts. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. So, yes, I am double fisting right now with caffeine and water. But all right. So first of all, I want to say thank you guys for having me. It's always a pleasure to come up here from you know the People's Republic a little bit further down south. Uh, so I am going to be talking about the energy water nexus, and I will say that I'm going to take kind of a, a large scale over. We're going to do kind of a large scale walk through what the energy water nexus is. But suffice it to say that the water sector requires a lot of power and the energy sector requires a lot of water. That is the energy water nexus in a nutshell. But what I'm most interested in is how extreme weather events, as well as long-term and short-term climate change, actually affect the interplay between the energy sector and the water sector. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. And I want to start by walking through the water requirements for the energy sector. So water for energy. That's going to be the first part of this talk. Maybe not. Point it up there. Ah, cool. I think the first one will start here. Guess what? We're not going anywhere. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, let's see here. Oh. Ah. Okay. Okay. Ah, now we're off and running. Okay. So when we think about water for power, water for the energy sector, believe it or not, water is actually required at every step along the way. It's required for extraction, it's required for transportation, refining, as well as processing, and most importantly, it's required for the generation of electricity at thermoelectric power plants. In fact, when we look across, this is, uh, shows the water foot or the water requirements for natural gas, uranium, as well as coal, you know, kind of our more conventional fuels that we use for power across the United States. Believe it or not, over 90, more like 95% of all the water that's used in the energy sector is actually used at the power plant level. It's not necessarily what's used for extraction. We hear a lot about water for hydraulic fracturing. Yes, that might be important locally, but on a larger scale, it's not quite as important as one might think. Now, when we look at how much water is being used at these power plants, the U.S. electricity sector, so again, just those power plants, about 45% of all the water that's used domestically actually goes to power plants. That's more than we actually use or, uh, with respect to agriculture and ranching. That's about 171 million gallons of water each day that run through power plants. Granted, there's a much smaller consumptive footprint, consumption being what's evaporated, withdrawal being just what's taken out of the system. And I'll get to the reason for this in a little bit. But I think it's also important to recognize, particularly talking to a group here in the West, that most of our water in this part of the country actually goes to agriculture. A very, a very minimal fraction in the Southwest is actually used for power plants. 
But that's not to say that water for power is not important here. Because as we know, particularly in the Colorado River Basin, excuse me, <clears throat> we're operating in a zero sum game. And the energy sector, we're seeing growth in the energy sector, we're seeing increasing populations. So the question is, will we actually need more water in our area for our power plants? Again, zero sum game, every drop counts. So we need to kind of explore that question. So I want to start with explaining why a power plant uses so much water, because I, I, I recognize this might be somewhat pedestrian for some of you, but I do think it's an important point and not everybody understands it. So say you have a power plant, coal-fired power plant. You burn your coal. The coal actually heats up a reservoir of water. That reservoir of water develops steam. Steam turns a turbine and voila, you have electricity. That's how, the, that's how we get electricity. But the important part of this cycle is one has to ensure that when you create the steam, that the steam recondenses. And, this and then that way the cycle can continue and you can continue to, uh, to generate electricity. But why you need so much water in these power plants is because the most efficient way to actually recondense the steam is to bring a whole bunch of water, of cold water through the power plant. So that cold water absorbs the heat, okay? This cooling water, that accounts for over 95% of all the water that is used in a given electric, in a power plant. So when we think about, again, the extraction all the way to the electricity generation, this cooling water makes up the bulk of all the water that is used by the energy sector across the US. Now, in terms of how much water is used at an individual power plant, there are two major factors that determine this. The first is the type of cooling technology that's used. When I talk about cooling technology, it's about how they ensure that there's a continuous flow of cold water into the power plant. Now, there are two major processes that are used at power plants across the US. The first is recirculating or, or evaporative cooling. You've probably heard about this. So what happens, you bring that cold water in a power plant, it absorbs the heat, but then what you have to do is you have to pull the heat off that cooling water so it can be recirculated back in the power plant. You can do that with cooling towers. Sometimes there's pond cooling or reservoir sort of cooling. The other type is once through cooling. So what you might have, you'll have a power plant sitting maybe on the ocean or sitting on a river or a lake or a stream, and you pull what the cold water in a power plant and you spit it back into that source. But so you have a continuous flow. But there are trade-offs with respect to these two processes. An evaporatively cooled power plant will actually consume between two to 30 times more water than a once through power plant per kilowatt or per unit of electricity that's actually generated. So you have a larger consumptive footprint when you're talking about evaporative cooling. On the other hand, a once through cooling, cooling facility will withdraw upwards of 60 times more water per unit of electricity that is, uh, that is generated relative to a recirculating cooling plant. So here you have a larger withdrawal footprint. The other trade-off that you have with the once through power plant, remember I said you bring that cold water in and you spit out the, the hot water? On average, that effluent, that effluent temperature, the temperature of that water is 10 degrees C or 17 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than when it came into the power plant. So you can imagine that there are some significant if, uh, issues relative to aquatic habitat and fisheries. Now there are two other types of cooling systems that can be used that we're actually seeing emerging, particularly as water issues are becoming more important across the US and globally. The first is dry cooling. And that's where instead of using water, one would bring really cold, dry air into a power plant. Let's just say the most optimal place to use this is in some place like Siberia, and I'm not kidding. So when temperatures, for example, extra, you know, temperatures, ambient temperatures get 90 degrees outside, 90, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, dry cooling isn't efficient, you can't use it. So there's hybrid systems as well where you can switch between dry cooling as well as wet cooling. But once again, hot temperatures outside, you have to switch to your wet cooled sort of uh, systems. And unfortunately, generally the places that get really hot are the ones where there aren't a lot of water. So there are still challenges with respect to dry cooling and hybrid systems. So the second thing that is really important in terms of determining how much water a power plant uses, so we have the cooling technology, is actually the fuel that's burned and it's how efficiently that fuel burns. And I like to tell this story by using the power plant that's, I can see this from my house, this is a Valmont generating station down in Boulder. Well, Excel Energy is gonna be shuttering this plant. It's roughly a 230 or so odd, or some odd megawatt facility. Now, if I wanna replace the capacity of this plant with another fuel, let's say I wanna go for a lower carbon fuel, what are the water trade-offs and what are the carbon trade-offs? So say, you know, I want to go with a zero carbon sort of technology. Well, concentrated solar power as well as nuclear, if I replace that capacity, 
it's actually going to use upwards of 10% more water per unit of electricity than our coal-fired power plant. So this is a really important point that low carbon is not necessarily low water. So let's say I go back to the drawing board and I want to use natural gas. There's a natural gas process or process, a type of plant that uses natural gas and it's uh, IGCC, Integrated Gasification Combined Cycle. This type of power plant, you would reduce your water use by about 70% and reduce your carbon by about 40%. But of course, we all know that there are some issues with fugitive methane emissions and, you know, kind of more further upstream. There are concerns. There's, uh, you know, induced seismicity. Okay, so maybe I want to avoid that. So let's look at another option. Carbon capture and storage. Now, I think folks might be familiar with this. The idea being that you, would, you basically capture what emissions might be happening and you, de you inject it into deep wells into the earth. This type of, of technology, you could vir virtually ameliorate the car your carbon emissions, but unfortunately, you would more than double the amount of water that would be used per unit of electricity generated. So let's say I want to go to utility scale PV or wind. Indeed, these are very low, if not, I won't say no, they're very low water type technologies. But when you look across that whole spectrum, one has to realize that both of these require rare earth elements that need very specific types of, and, and very specific types of water in their construction. So the bottom line in all this, and I always feel like Debbie Down Downer when I give this talk, is that there's not, there is no perfect answer. It's all about the trade-offs. It's all about what is the best, the best option for where I live and what resources I have available. So I really like this graphic because this is a really nice representation of what I just what I just showed. And this is some work that was done by some of our colleagues, the national, the other NRL down in Golden. And what it shows is it shows the withdrawals in gallons per megawatt hour and the consumptive use related to different fuel types and the different technologies. And this is really nice because you can see that trade-off between consumptive use as well as withdrawals associated with, with the cooling technology and the relative differences in, for example, nuclear versus coal versus things like biofuels. So I'd encourage folks to look at that if you're interested in more detail. So why do we actually care about the energy water nexus? The reason that I care about it is because we've experienced what I characterize as collisions at the energy water nexus across the US in the last 10 years or so. And what I mean by that is that we've had power plants that have either had to shut down or have had to curtail production because of water related impacts. There are three different impacts that we've seen across the US. The first, there's not enough water. You have an intake. If you can't reach the intake, you can't pull water in the power plant. What's really interesting, yes, drought has been the driver of a lot of these problems where there's not enough water, but during the polar vortex, and this is an example that's actually not on this map, the polar vortex on the Missouri, in the Missouri River, there was so much ice damming that there wasn't enough water actually further downstream in the river, and so some of the power plants actually couldn't pull water into the, into the plants. So unfortunately, we have really hot periods when we need the air conditioning turned on where we don't have power plants running. And then we have really cold times when we need heating when we don't have, uh, have access to water in some cases. The other two reasons relate to water temperature. So if the intake temperatures of, your power, of that water coming to your power plant are too high, then that cycle, that Carnot engine sort of cycle within your power plant can't operate efficiently. So that's when you have, basically it's not economically uh, useful to, to really run the power plant. And in the case of nuclear power, it's flat out dangerous. That's what we call a nuclear meltdown. The other part of this is effluent temperatures. Remember, I talked about how warm those waters, that water is. Believe it or not, there are temperatures, effluent temperatures of power plants that exceed 115 degrees Fahrenheit. To put that in perspective, if you have a hot tub, your hot tub's probably about 101 degrees Fahrenheit. And so that effluent temperature, there are actually regulations in about 15 states where effluent temperatures can't exceed 90 degrees Fahrenheit. But during emergencies, those regulations are actually put by the, by the wayside in order to ensure that, the, that we can keep the air conditioning on. Because when it comes to these collisions, this isn't just about being able to you know, plug in my laptop. There are really, really uh, significant public safety and hazard concerns. Now, I want to take a moment because, again, you know, I'm a big water fan about water in the West, and I do, I'm, even though I'm not going to talk about hydro, hydroelectric at the Energy Water Nexus, I do want to talk very briefly about Hoover Dam. So this is Lake Mead on Hoover Dam. This is a picture I took last summer. So maximum elevation is 1,220 feet. Today, as of yesterday, actually, uh, the elevation at Lake Mead was 1074. 
for every foot that Lake Mead drops, you lose 5.7 megawatts of capacity. Right now, Hoover Dam is over only operating about 23% of its potential. This is really important because even, even only operating at 23, 25% of its potential, Hoover Dam provides about 80% of all the peaking power for all the eight, what, kind of the eight sort of western, southwestern states. So that's something to really keep in, uh, keep in mind. The other thing that's interesting is what I, what's called the hydrocritical level. So the way that, you know, the headspace between a dam, you, you, need this, you need a higher elevation in order to push water through the turbines to generate your electricity. Once that level, the level of Lake Mead gets to 1050, you actually have to shut down the entire power plant. Now Reclamation has actually been tried, they're actually trying to build a lower intake on the dam so that they can increase that headspace and increase the, the flow through the dam, but it's not yet, yet completed. But this, this is a very real issue that's very particular to the Western US that I just wanted to point out. So as I mentioned, when it comes to energy water and these collisions, these hazards are really important in public safety. And I wanna point out two examples from Europe. The first being the heat wave in 2003 in France. Now France is really reliant on nuclear power, okay? Now when the drought, there was a drought and there was a massive heat wave in the area, initially at the power plants, the intake, I'm sorry, the effluent temperatures exceeded what were French regulations in terms to protect aquatic habitat. But they again, needed to keep the air conditioning on and make sure that their cooling centers were still available to the public. So they just said, we've got to put those regulations to the side. But then ultimately, the temperatures of the source water became so high that they had to shut down their power plants. And the best research that I've seen, about 50,000 heat-related deaths occurred in France as a result of the 2003 heat wave. How many of those are directly attributed to lack of cooling in power plants? We don't necessarily know, but it was absolutely a contributing factor. Similarly, another one, reliance on, on nuclear power, Spain, Germany, France, the UK, more heat waves in 2006, where similarly, there was not adequate power to keep people cool. So there's some very real risks related to the energy water nexus. So the question that I keep wanting to get at is, you know, is there a risk that such an event could happen here in the US in the near future? But to kind of start getting at that question, we need to take a step back and we really need to look at what is our picture of water use across the US? You know, I started with the 171 million gallons of water per day being withdrawn, but those data are so different when you look across the US and where, what type of water we use. So this is a map that shows in the year 2008, how much water was used at individual power plants, and we, the colors indicate the type of cooling. And what you see is that the East Coast is particularly reliant on the once through power plants. So you see these large bubbles of power plants that are withdrawing a tremendous amount of water. Whereas primarily in the West, you are using, once you're using evaporative cooling. So here we're actually consuming a little bit more water than they are in the East Coast uh, relative to what's being withdrawn. The other way that we want to slice this, of course, we all know there's different flavors of water, if you will. So I love showing this graphic when I go back east because folks do not necessarily appreciate it. Most people think, well, of course all of our cooling water comes from surface water. But if you look at, for example, the lower Colorado River Basin, California, and some of the other western places, when you run out of surface water, you go to alternative sources. You go to groundwater. You go to recycled water. And this is something, this is an interesting, I think, perspective because I think it shows some of the adaptations that we have in the West to looking at unique solutions to water availability for power plants. And then this is also one of my favorite ways to slice and dice this. It's to look at the freshwater gallons of water, sorry, the gallons of freshwater used to generate a kilowatt hour of electricity in your state. And this is the withdrawal footprint. And it's pretty fascinating when you look at some states where they're using upwards of 45 gallons for one kilowatt hour of electricity. Then you have other states where it's less than one. And then I think this is also nice because it really illustrates the difference between the evaporative cooling in, on, in the West and the, uh, the once through cooling on the East Coast, where you see a larger consumptive footprint, particularly in our area of the country. Granted, it's still pretty small, less than one gallon per kilowatt hour, but it's that's not insignificant. Now, there's, again, so many different ways we can look at this. And I, I did not go into, into detail on, the, on this particular study. But the point that I want to make here, believe it or not, these data were incredibly difficult to come up, come up with. Because I'm sure you're looking at this going, Kristen, you're showing me stuff from 2008, really? 
I'll just tell you the data with respect to what to the, to the to water use by thermoelectric power plants is incredibly poor. The Energy Information Administration, which is part of the Department of Energy, is supposed to collect that from every power plant across the US. But now we're gonna look at the problems with those data set. And you know, I like to tell this story is I, when I first thought, you know, I should, I was, I was working with some colleagues and they're like, we should start looking at how much water are we using for power plants? And I was like, well, there's a database and I can go into that database and I should be able to pull this out and this will be no problem. This took us almost three years to put together. The first problem that we had, geolocation. So I like this because I took this screenshot, and this was probably day one of, the, of this energy water effort that started about five years ago. And what this is, I just pulled the data set from the Energy Information Administration and pulled it into Google, Google Earth. And this is supposed to show different power plants, the different colors or the different fuels and their geolocation across the US. Well, there were a couple things that stood out. This is a power plant that's apparently located in the middle of the Gulf. There were also, and I wish I'd taken a screenshot at the time, but I didn't. There's also one that was in the middle of the Indian Ocean and another that was in the Southern Ocean. I think they were probably wrong. Let's just say that what we, uh, we found was that the geolocation data were absolutely ter terrible. The so the Department of Energy, not collecting great data on where power plants are actually located. And if we're gonna look at something related to water, we really need to know what watershed it's in and what to, in order to, to get a bigger picture of these things. So what we did as a part of this project, there were some amazing interns and a graduate students and an undergraduate who actually used Google Earth to look at all 7,000 power plants across the United States to verify their geolocation. So this is actually a Google Earth image. This is the Valmont Generating Station right near where, where I live. Uh, and so we're like, okay, hey, there's a power plant there. You know, there's the coal, there's your cooling source. All right, we're in good shape. What we found, for example, there was actually one power plant on the West Slope. They actually reported their geolocation to the Department of Energy as being where Excel headquarters was in Denver. So there were a lot of problems that we found like that. So that was the first step was we had to fix where, where were all these power plants were located. The second thing was the data themselves. And I like to use this example from South Carolina. Sorry, choose your unit of your favorite unit. <laughs> Sorry, I digress. So the EIA had said there was about, you know, 988,000 acre feet, acre feet of water that was used by the state of South Carolina in 2008. Well, the state actually collects these data separately. Look at the difference. <laughs> That's almost a tenfold increase. So state of South Carolina, actually they were kept said, we're using 10 times more water than the Energy Information Administration was actually saying we're using. And this was a theme that we found over and over again. There are a lot of different people that are collecting information about water use at power plants, but there's no sort of uh, one mechanism to kind of put them all together and to reconcile them all. A colleague of mine in Texas, he said he went to a power plant uh, and this particular power plant in Texas has to report to three different entities, had you know, the state, the feds, and then they had kind of a regional organization, they had to report water use. There were three different people reporting data to three different agencies, and they didn't even know, these three people didn't even know that they existed within the same sort of power plant. So this, this is how problematic this is. So what we did in order to get out of the water data that I showed you, in, showed you in those maps was we went back to this effort from our colleagues at NREL. And we use the generation at these power plants to estimate how much water was withdrawn and how much was consumed at power plants across the, in the year 2008. And what we had to do in order to ensure that we got the best estimates, once again, we turned to Google Earth. We had to verify the cooling technologies. We verified the fuel source. We actually called managers at individual power plants to make sure that what was in the database was accurate. And we had to update about 25% of all the power plants because those data were so poor. And we found some interesting things. I'd like to point this out because this is an interesting adaptation. So this is a power plant in Georgia, and this is a cooling tower right here. You can see the big coal, coal kind of that's kind of running through. This is the river that it's located on. It's pulling into the power plant. Remember I said that hot effluent, these are actually cooling towers. So they're actually cooling the effluent that's going back into the river so that way they don't exceed those uh, the, the regulatory sort of regimes with respect to water temperatures. But what I also find interesting about this, this water use isn't necessarily report, the water consumption there is not necessarily reported to the EIA. So as kind of our, our systems are, are adapting to changes, 
we're not necessarily adapting our policies in terms of how, how we're ingesting data and information. And the outcome of this effort, we ended up with a, a huge database. That's the way I would put it. We had over, I think it was 20,000 EGUs, electricity generating units, at almost 7,000 power plants across the US. We had them corrected for geolocation. We actually verified the water source. So it wasn't, there was a lot more embedded in this than what I just showed. I just showed you two, two significant examples. Um, and then we had estimated water withdrawals and estimated consumptive use. And this is a nice illustration of how poor the data are. So in green, remember, we have a range of withdrawals and consumptive use. Here's a minimum, here's a maximum based on the estimates that we use from NREL. In green, these are places where the EIA data were actually within our estimated range. In red, these are, so, so this is the Soros Red Rainy up here and then Alaska. Even though there were power plants that were thermoelectric power plants that had to have used water, not a single power plant in either of those places, regions actually reported any water use in the year 2008 EIA. By the way, they're supposed to, it's kind of the law. <laughs> and then in pink, these are places where they underreported. So they, if they were below where our absolute minimum estimate of water, potential water was. And then in other places, in blue, these are places that actually reported much more water use than we thought was possible. In dark blue, these are regions where the water use was actually over double what we thought the maximum could be. And there was very little rhyme or reason to a lot of this. There were two factors, however, that we, we, we were able to, to pull out about why the data were so crummy. The first was that the EIA didn't collect information about water use from nuclear power plants that year. After 9-11, they said it was a security risk to collect that information because it would uh, illuminate some sort of vulnerabilities at nuclear power plants. But there were also budget, budget issues with respect to EIA. At least that's what the Department of Energy has shared with us. So about 25% of that missing data was because they weren't collecting information on nuclear power plants. The other one was, I mentioned, power plants that just didn't report any water use. So these are power plants, that's the, the different colors, I'm sorry, the, 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 cap, the key seems to have disappeared. Power plants that generated electricity but didn't report any water use, even though we know that they're thermoelectric power plants. And these accounted for somewhere around 5% of, the, of the, what I would call the missing piece. But really, when it came down to it, the remainder was just the fact that Department of Energy, power plants, they didn't really, weren't really thinking about water being really important and what water managers and those of us that think about all of the uses of water might be needing. What was really fortunate is there was a GAO report that came out right about the same time that we started looking into this that directed the EIA in, in the collaboration with the USGS to start improving how they collect data with respect to, to power plant water use. And so we actually shared with, we actually shared, I can't believe I just said that. We shared our data with um, Department of Energy as well as the USGS. They used our geolocation data to improve their, uh, their own data. And then for the next USGS water census, they actually uh, used some of, some of this information in our database to try to improve what they did. So, the most reason, so we're pretty proud of that because we really feel like we, we, it, was pretty, it was a large scale effort. And we thought we did a pretty good job trying, trying to improve what honestly were some pretty basic things. And this allowed us to, to kind of jump into some really interesting analyses and kind of get where we wanted to go. And this is some work that uh, I worked with James Meldrum sitting here on. Uh, and this is the water, it's the Surface Water Supply Stress Index, or the WASI. Uh, so, and what this shows is these are Huck 8 scale watersheds, and shades of yellow, suffice it to say, that's where naturally occurring, okay, naturally occurring water resources within a, that very small sort of hydrologic unit do not actually meet local demands. So these are not necessarily places that are running out of water. These are just, it's kind of like, what I like to think of it as um, the light on your, you know, your, your, your check engine light comes on in your car. You're like, is my engine gonna explode or is it just a low tire or an O2 sensor? And you're not really sure. So these are just places where we need to look in a little bit more detail about, uh, about what's going on with our water. And I'm gonna get back to this in a couple minutes. But our improved analyses also allowed us to look specifically at water stress related to agriculture as well as municipal, municipal, yeah, municipal demand. Oh gee, shocker, Southern California lights up like a Christmas tree. And then thermoelectric power generation. And what's really interesting about this particular analysis is that you can see these shades of red. 
that there's only one power plant in these individual uh, units. So what this, what this means and the reason why this is important, building one large scale power plant can really change the water balance and the water demands in a, in a given region. It's an important consideration. So I'm preaching to the choir on this one, so I'm just gonna go over through this very quickly. But of course, we have to ask the question, how will this picture change with respect to climate change? So when we think about climate change and the energy water nexus, we have to think about how climate impacts both the supply and the demand side for both energy and water. So on the water side, in general, and I know you guys could all pick this apart, I could pick this apart myself, suffice it to say across the US on average, declines in average in stream flow, declines in groundwater availability, and increasing demands for water. Because as it gets hotter out, we might have, a, we'll just flat out, you'll need more water for certain process, for certain items. We can expect increasing intensities and frequencies of drought. We can also in, uh, expect increasing duration and increasing frequency of heat waves. So that means when you have that heat wave, you're gonna have more electricity demand. And then, of course, again, increasing demand, you're gonna need to turn on your air conditioning. And of course, this is all superimposed on a growing population. So one of the questions that we've been grappling with is not just what are the risks with respect to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, what are the risks with respect to public uh, health and safety related to the energy water nexus, but also is it possible to, demo to, to design an electricity system that will meet the power demands of the future with a greater population during heat waves under these, under these future conditions? And we've been working specifically with NREL, again, the other NREL, uh, uh, using a platform called the Regional Energy Deployment System, or REEDS. Now, I won't go into detail on REEDS. It's a very complex modeling uh, structure, but it's attractive for several reasons. The first is its spatial resolution. A lot of the energy models where it det where that determine where you're going to build a power plant across the U.S. under different parameters, they're resolved at a larger scale. The higher resolution allows us to do some more, uh, allowed us initially when we started working on this, to do some more uh, credible, is the way that I would put it, mapping with, with water resource regions. The second thing that I quite like about it, the model actually incorporates international, national, regional, state, and local policies for that related to air quality and carbon that would drive decisions related to investments in large scale power plant infrastructure. And then lastly, this new iteration of REEDS you can, it will actually constrain where you build a power plant based on water availability. So I skipped everything that I talked about before. That was stuff that went on about five years ago. And in between, we were doing a lot of what I would call kind of back-end sort of analyses around the water, the water demands related and, and reads and what might happen in different regions with different power plants sort of uh, uh, mobilization. But now we're at a point where we've been able to incorporate, you know, can't build that power plant if there's no water there. And what we did in kind of the, the results, and I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna go through this really quickly, um, but, and also I don't wanna bore you all with, with climate scenarios, but uh, what we did was we looked at the CMIP5 data set because we wanted to introduce this into REEDS to again, kind of just, we wanted, we wanted to look at an extreme scenario. That's the way that I would put it. And so what we did was we looked at different traces from the CMIP5 data set of temperature as well as the hydrology. And we focused specifically again, wanting to get at extremes on the Colorado River Basin for the months of June to September. June to September, that's usually when you have low water, because you know, you've kind of gone through your summer, you've diminished a lot of your water resources, and you have high temperatures. That's actually when we have the highest demands usually on the, on the electricity grid are during those months, particularly in the later months, believe it, um, August and September. So again, we wanted to look at the extremes. So then what we did was we found the, different, the particular traces under three different scenarios. We had a hot, dry scenario, a hot, wet scenario, and something that we called moderately hot, which was <laughs> kind of our, our, our business as usual. And then what we did was once we selected those individual traces, we backed them out and we pulled out humidity, uh, uh, calculated cooling degree days, heating degree days, as well as the water availability for all the basins across the US from those CMIP pipe traces. Then we also, on the demand side, for, for agricultural water demands, municipal water demands, we just had to do a linear extrapolation in terms of increasing population. I know that's not the most robust way to do things, but that was the best that we could do with this analysis. So here, I'm just gonna kind of go through what I think are the most interesting results of this. So this is a scenario where we increased water demand only because of a growing population, but we assumed stationarity with respect to uh, water availability. So we said we have just as much water available in the future as we do today but we have the increasing demands from the population, both in terms of energy and as in terms of water. 
And what we see here, these are actually relative changes in the deployment of utility scale PV and natural gas combined cycle, both low water, low carbon, relatively low carbon technologies, and the changes that one would see in deployment relative to today. So in shades of blue, what you see is these are increases of between 80 to 100 percent of deployment of utility scale PV relative to what we have today. And then in brown, these would be decreases in what we have today. And you can see, for example, so I'll just leave it there. But here's where I think and where the important point is. When we look at our hot and dry scenario, we see a very different per a picture emerge. So again, we have the same demands on our water system here, uh, relative uh, for uh, on our water system, but we're changing the picture. We're not assuming stationary. We're considering the changes in climate on, on humidity, cooling degree days, et cetera. And what we see here, for example, it would be massive build out of solar PV and um, utility scale PV in the southeastern United States relative to what you would have if you assume stationary. And IGCC, you see this blow up all over the map. The important point here, this is not necessarily to say this is the best direction forward or we have to do this or we should be building power plants here. It's just to say that climate should, be, should necessarily be considered. Because when you build a power plant, it's around for a bloody long time. And when we're talking about renewables and renewable deployment, yeah, you can move a wind farm, you can do that, but you can't move the grid. And so there are a lot of really important issues that we're grappling right with right now in terms of, how, of, of our energy sector in transition. I also like this graphic. So this map, what this shows is under our hot and dry scenario, the changes, relative changes in water demands for thermoelectric power generation uh, at, at, at the large scale, the HUC2 sort of level across the United States relative to today. And so in the east, you see in general, it looks like we might need more water to run to power our power plants. Not surprising, we have growing population, et cetera. Well, this is the one that, I, that really raises my eyebrows. Granted, we're talking about no change or modest increase in the lower Colorado as well as the Rio Grande with respect to, to power generation. But again, we're in a zero sum game. We're looking at a future that's hotter and drier. That with, and that's a fairly robust statement for this part of the country. So that is something that we absolutely need to consider particularly when we're thinking about conservation and opportunities there. So now I'm going to take kind of the last five minutes or so to talk about the other part of the nexus, and that is the energy, or rather the electricity, that's actually required for our water systems. I will say, once again, these data are absolutely terrible. There's no really strong, really, really robust estimate of how much power, how much electricity sector the elect uh, how much electricity the water sector actually uses. But the best estimate I've seen for the US is roughly 13%. In the Southwest, we're looking at more like upwards of 20%. And this is just the water that is required to pump, to convey, and to clean our water. It's not talking about water, heating your water in your home, which actually is the bulk of the energy that's embedded in our water supplies. So I said I was gonna return to this. And again, I'm not gonna go into detail in this analysis, but these places in red and yellow, this is the West. We're heavily adapted uh, in terms of how we're gonna deal with our, our arid sort of situation. So what these places, these places are not running out of water necessarily. What they're doing is they are over pumping groundwater. They're conveying water for over long distances. They're using alternative water supplies, which require cleaning, or they're using reservoir storage. And those first three, not the reservoir storage, but the first three require a lot of energy. So I like to illustrate this point by looking at the energy embedded in water supplies in different places across the country. If you live in New York, you're using about a third of a kilowatt hour per every 100 gallons of water that you're using in your house. Okay, so this is, we're talk, talking about fresh water. And I'm, again, I'm not talking about heating in the house. If you live in Northern California, you're using about 25% more. So, man, maybe 30% more. So you're using about a, quarter, or a fourth of a kilowatt hour for every 100 gallons in your household. The reason that that's modestly higher is because you actually have, there is modest conveyance there, but you have a lot more groundwater pumping. Whereas in this part of the country, you're talking more about cleaning water. You live in Southern California, you're using almost five times more energy to get fresh water to your house than you are if you live in New York. And that's because you're conveying, you're not only conveying water from the Colorado River and from Northern California, you also have groundwater and you also have processes now like desalination, which is actually not included in here. But again, 
high, you have this, this adaptation that we have in the West comes at a cost, and that penalty right now is related to energy. So this graphic, I want to look in a little bit more detail in the West. What this shows are the major water projects across the U.S. that are either fully operational, those in blue, or, and I'm sorry this says under construction, it should say under consideration. Some of these are under construction, but these are in red, they're just, they're not op fully operational yet. Now, these blue projects, all told, about 12 million acre foot of water are being moved across the, across the western U.S. That's roughly the annual flow on the Colorado River. That's how much water is being moved into the different places. In all told, almost 3,000 miles of pipelines. And that is just from these projects. There are much smaller projects, but I chose some of the largest to show in this graphic. And of these, the one that I think is the most interesting is the Central Arizona Project. CAP is actually the most energy intensive project in the US, and it's been around for a while. But there's some really interesting facts about it. Number one, so it conveys water from Lake Havasu, goes up to Phoenix, and then up to Tucson. Notice I said up, okay? It goes 300 miles, and it goes up over 3,000 feet in elevation, okay? And it uses over 3 million megawatt hours of electricity every year. And the kicker is, most of the electricity that's used to power this system, to move this water, comes from the Navajo Generating Station, which historically has been one of the top three carbon emitters on the, in the country. So if you live in Arizona and you want to think about where your water, you want to reduce your carbon footprint, you want to think about where your water is coming from. So now I want to talk about these uh, proposed water supplies. Future water, again, 12 million acre feet currently being conveyed. Just these projects in red, this is another almost 5 million acre feet of water that we're talking about moving around to growing population centers. And this is an analysis that James and I did where we actually pulled, we estimated the and, and pulled out the best we could from some of the, the doc, some documents, the gross power intensity of these emerging water supplies. So you have the Twin Tunnels project in California, uh, NISP here in Colorado and some, you know, this is, this is essentially what we're looking at. This is the energy embedded in those water deliveries. But what I want to talk about are these two right here. This red line, this is the net power intensity of the Central Arizona project, which as I said is right now the most intense water supply project in the country. But we have two projects right here that have the potential, all told, to have a greater energy cost than the cap. Now, the Southern Delivery System is partially operational. That's here in Colorado. Um, this bar, and again, gross. There is the opportunity to reduce this number, but what I'm really interested in is how do we get there? How do we actually ensure that? It what are the policy mechanisms, and et cetera? And then the Groundwater Development Project, this is actually Southern Nevada Water Authority, where they're talking about bringing water from Northern Nevada down to the south, excuse me, because they're running out of water for Lake Mead. And this project, We'll see, believe it or not, it actually might be dead in the water, the reason being this particular footprint. So again, as we continue to adapt to really low water supplies and a growing population, we really need to consider how much energy we're using and what the carbon implications are. And I kind of want to end this by, <coughs> by talking about California. And I apologize, I did not update this. This is the drought monitor from April, but let's just say it hasn't changed too much for California. But I'd like to tell this story because since the drought has started, the most recent drought, 2011 or so, hydropower production has declined across the state. Now, to make up for that lack of generation, they have amped up the wind and solar, but they've also have to amp, had to amp up natural gas. And remember, yes, natural gas is lower carbon, but it is not no carbon. So you can still amp up, if you have to go too, too high with your natural gas, it, you're still emitting carbon. And as a consequence, the emissions of carbon in the state have increased between 8 and 16 percent across the, 8 and 16 percent since the beginning of the drought, just because they've had to pump up their natural gas production or natural gas electricity production. And as a result, when we look at the agricultural sector, $2.7 billion in revenue loss. That's the latest data from um, UC Davis. And of that, roughly a quarter it's just because of the increased pump, uh, cost of pumping. It's not the price, it's the cost. It's because they don't have the surface water available, so they're pumping groundwater, particularly in the Central Valley. And as you continue to pump the groundwater, it gets lower and lower, which means you have to pump even more and more, and then you have to use more energy to bring it up. And I think this is the perfect example of not just the energy water nexus, 
but in particular, how that connects with our food systems, agricultural, and land use. And so I just really briefly want to talk about what's next. Uh, right now, believe it or not, I'm working with Exxon uh, on a more robust analysis using reads of uh, using the CMIP5 data set. So before we kind of, you know, it was a little bit of a, a back of the envelope. Let's look at some of these extremes. Now we're doing a more robust analysis, and that's also with the Department of Energy. We're also working to connect climate models with the wet operational weather models that are used to run, to run the grid. The grid is actually run second by second, even at sub-second sort of intervals. So we want to simulate what's the crazy weather that we might have in the future, and can we, would, it, would, it, would a grid, like what Reeds is saying, would that, actually, would that actually work? I kind of want to ask those kind of questions. The next, I mentioned about the reduction in terms of gross power intensity of our systems and reducing that. Uh, and uh, I, I'm really fascinated by the Carlsbad desal plant, which went operational in Southern California. It's the most uh, efficient, energy efficient water project, uh, or excuse me, desal plant actually in the world. And what was very interesting is they started thinking about this plant when there wasn't a drought, yet there were still policy incentives uh, to, to really make sure that it was energy efficient. So I'm very curious that, that now that we're in a drought, and there seems to be this, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? We need more water, we need more water. Are we gonna be able to achieve that kind of low carbon footprinting as they try to ramp up additional desal plants in the state? And then the last one is, I've been working with a lot of people, and Ken and other people here, <laughs> uh, on food energy water systems, and we're really fortunate to get funded for one of these NSF Innovations in Food Energy Water Systems proposals to look at the what I would call the virtu the traded virtual water, virtual food, and virtual carbon across the United States. And I had another proposal. Uh, we called it work. I wanted to call it TWERP, towards water and energy. I just thought that was going to be the best acronym ever. I digress. But and this was a more glo a global look. It wasn't funded, but we're still looking to kind of build that out. So so I'm just kind of you know I kind of kind of started just with a broad overview of the energy water nexus. But it really does matter. It's really important for these kinds of systems. And lastly, I want to thank all the people that worked on this. There were probably 100 people, and I don't have the full list, but James was really instrumental. I think he was a co-author or the author on almost every paper that I, uh, that I, that I talked about up here. And so, thanks. Thank you. Time for questions? Uh, yes. Kristen, your, your effort, big effort to improve upon the EIA <laughs> data on water use in the energy sector. It sounds a lot like uh, the Deal and Harris effort from the USGS. Yes, yep. And so, so how do those two compare? Right, so it, it, we actually worked with them a little bit. We actually started our analysis. We were working, it was a project funded through Kresge, by the Kresge Foundation, um, and working with Union of Concerned Scientists. And I, I had the fortune of being the, the lead, the scientific lead on that project. And we started ramping up our, our work, and then uh, Deal and Harris started doing theirs. And what Deal and Harris did is they, they went to their, they were estimating the water use at individual at power plants, but they were using a more thermodynamic sort of estimate. Whereas what we did, or what NREL did in terms of their estimates, is that they were actually using more empirical data by looking at what they felt were credible water estimates at power plants across the US in terms of consumptive use and withdrawal to get at that, that range. And so they were very complimentary. And we actually did work with them. We provided them all of our geolocation data and all of that for that effort. So, so if that answers it. <laughs> how do you think the estimates from the two efforts on water use specific and not, I mean, right, right. stuff sounds great, but. How do you think the two estimates compare, or should one be preferred over the other? What I think they're, they're very similar. Um, we, we did kind of, when they first started their effort, we, we actually did kind of a comparison on some uh, of some of those. And when I say we, this was really led by our colleagues at Department of Energy and NREL. Um, so they were, I can't say one is better than the other. There are challenges and trade-offs with both. Of course, we have a large range with respect to uh, on, the, on the NREL paper, Jordan's pa Jordan Macknick's paper. On the other paper, it was, yes, it's a much smaller range, but there were questions, for example, of, well, does it really take into account some of, some of the operational sort of issues that might be happening? Because it is primarily a thermodynamic um, estimate, if, if that makes sense. And I also know James did some of the, the life cycle analysis work uh, with MRL, so I know he could answer that too, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, I was just stand on the fact that they're both imperfect data. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I agree that there's not one 
this. It's a gold standard. The, the one thing I would say is that the NREL effort was done once, and I believe the USGS is an ongoing effort. So right. going towards the future, you probably want to shift more towards the USGS one. Yeah, that's a good point. Any other questions? Yeah. Yep. You talked about the amount of energy used like in central Arizona to just yeah. move the water uphill, for example, and all that mileage. Are you aware of a location there anywhere where uh, the user has to pay for some of the other costs associated with water? So for example, the environmental costs, the, the carbon footprint costs, or if there's an environmental cost associated with pumping um, the effluent back out, if it's having, you know, that would offset maybe habitat restoration. Or is, is it, do you know of any areas where, they, yeah, where the user question. basically has a disincentive environmentally to use more water? That's a great question. I, I don't have an answer to that. The one thing that I could say is that when it comes to our water systems in general, the largest capital cost after human resources is energy. So it's a, there's a business case for reducing the energy footprint in terms of how it's going to play out in terms of water pricing. Um, if you look at I'll just leave it there. <laughs> and so, but I don't know. That's a good question though. That's really interesting. In, in this analysis, have you been seeing any, I guess, innovation in how the whole cooling um, cycle works? Because it seems like there are potential for hybrid systems that would pump water underground yep. to cool it, um, or even access deeper groundwater right. that you don't use for, for drinking water to actually then use to cool and then bring it back up? You know, that in particular, I'm not aware of, but what I will say is that there's a tremendous amount of innovation that has actually gone to market overseas, uh, with whether, whether it's desal, whether it's different types of utility scale solar that aren't necessarily, um, you know, we're, we're a little risk averse in the U.S. in terms of investing in large scale infrastructure that isn't proven. Uh, so there are opportunities there to look at what's happening overseas. I know there's a tremendous innovation in the Department of Energy laboratories and in our engineering departments, et cetera, but it's just, this is kind of the other, you know, the valley of death of how do you get that actually to market. So I think there are, there, I've seen some amazing things, but it's how do we actually get that so it shows up on the map and get people to, to, to look at that. So my ignorance is astounding here, and you just raised the point who is paying for all of the electricity to move the water to Phoenix, for example, or to Fort Collins? <laughs> it's, it, you know, that actually plays very much on that question. Yeah. Is Again, that you, know, you can look at, one would expect, for example, water prices then to be more expensive where you have more energy, but that's not necessarily the case. And that was actually what I was going to say, and I stopped myself. And it's, it's very much, you know, you have so many subsidies with respect to water, and not everybody pays, a farmer's not going to pay the same amount for water as I pay in my household. And so there's really a question about how do we actually price water relative to our energy resources, the role of subsidies, um, et cetera, is the way that I would put it. I mean, it is, it is really fascinating to try and pull apart. And you know, one of the questions that I've had, when if you looked at the original energy uh, uh, requirement for Carlsbad and the price of water there, your water, like your cup of glass of water from the tap would cost almost as much, if it came from that desal plant, would cost almost as much as if I paid 99 cents or $1.10 or whatever for my bottle at 7-Eleven. Uh, but then they were able to reduce that cost, so now it's, you know, it's a lot smaller. But that's how expensive and how much energy we're talking about being embedded in that water supply. So is this even on the radar, this is probably a silly question, of any policymakers? Yes, I would say. I mean, because I, just to the extent that water, you know, pricing of water has always been. But when it comes to the power plant, power plants are so expensive. The natural gas, everything, even if you, you know, you could completely amplify the price of the water for that power plant, and that would just be a blip on the radar for the power plant. And there's so much, you know, political will of maintaining the power plants and yeah. flow of electricity that they trump a lot of different things, you know, related to conservation, the heat return, right. those sort of regulations. So, you know, the, the need for energy to keep the lights burning, keeping the stoves burning um, is really you know, part of that uh, mixture. That's why you had, you had one figure up there that talked about the upper Colorado where that dependence of the surface water, that was like one of the yeah. key areas where they only depend on surface water. But then I think about, you know, sort of the use of the upper Colorado River that's being pumped east, yep. you know, to the front range and, you know, the changing climate conditions so that 
they're, they're sort of vulnerable yeah. unless they've already started thinking about alternative sources of water for cooling right. in that region, right? Well, you know, most of the power plants, particularly in the Front Range, they're junior rights holders. But, they get, again, they can pay a lot to lease those rights from ag. I, one of the most interesting conversations I had with somebody at Excel Energy about some of the initial research that we were doing um, was I, I found this a very fascinating perspective. Well, you know, if it wasn't for the power plants, we would, you know, agriculture would fall apart because you can't halfway, you know, your crop isn't viable if you halfway water it. So if I buy up from all these farms, I'm, I'm, I'm sustaining agriculture and sustaining the farming community by running my power plant. I thought that was really interesting. Um, but, you know, that's the kind of perspective. It's also worth noting, for example, during the drought, the Oklahoma, Texas drought several years ago, there was a major issue with respect to water rights on that, that Colorado River and on the Little Colorado. And it went what was fascinating, they basically threw the rights out the window. They said, we have to keep this power plant running because of public safety. That never went to court. I'm really curious if something like that happened here. Oh, you betcha we'd be in court. So that's a pretty fascinating thing to think about too. Yeah. This is another detail, I guess. Uh -huh. Earlier in, in your talk, you were mentioning the, comparing the consumptive use of water. Right. Per kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. At once through plants versus the recycling. Yeah, yeah. Um, and my, my question is, does that estimate of water consumption at once through the plant take into account the higher temperature of, of the stream mm -hmm. down, downstream of the plant and the extra evaporation that will happen because the temperature is higher? No. <laughs> it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It should. And that's, you know, that's part of the imperfection, I would say, of these kind of consumptive estimates. Um, in fact, the, the way that in the NREL study, the way that they dealt with consumption was in, la in a large part um, just as a fraction of the total withdrawal in many cases. Um, I, I should also just mention we, in that analysis, and I, I'd ask, I've asked this question a couple times, we also, they, they we all also tried to tease apart where there regional differences, for example, like if you're talking about the Southeast where it's really humid, or you're talking about a place where it's really dry, are there significant differences in terms of your consumptive footprint or withdrawal footprint for the same type of power plant, and we couldn't find anything. And so I think it, that kind of falls within the noise, but I do think that that's something that's really important. And that, that's that's really important that we're just not accounting for, but it's a great question. Yes. Um, this is kind of off topic. That's okay. Topic. <laughs> I was just curious if you um, looked at the, like the water consumption and um, electricity uses at the factory farms. Like if you like kind of included that in this PowerPoint or like yeah considered a different thing. Just curious. Yeah, that the way that that's generally considered is in industrial uses is the way that I would carry, that I would say that it is. And so, no, it's not something that we've explicitly looked at. Um, but I bet if you went to the USGS water census in that industry sort of piece, they might talk about that. Because they, they do know that they break apart some sort of industry, some of the industry uses of water in there. So, no worries. Oh, great. Thanks All right. a lot. Thanks. Great. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And next week, we have uh, one of our own, Bill Pardon, will be here giving the seminar <laughs> looking at some of the agricultural side of things so thank you